3 o'clock, right on. Um, yeah, so I'm Tim Smith. I'm a community engineer here at Chef. I work on the community cookbook team. Um, you've probably seen some of the stuff I have worked on, or maybe some of the cookbooks. Uh, so I've been, been through a bit of a journey of testing, and I kind of want to share everything with you. Uh, I do want to throw out just one quick warning. Uh, I'm definitely going to start from the absolute beginning. So if you consider yourself a decent tester, like a solid I do testing, uh, this might not be for you. Uh, you can enjoy the rest of your, your day. Um, so the, the first question I think I want to ask is really just why test at all? It's kind of the, the elephant in the room. And I know out there somewhere somebody is saying, like, it's just my servers, it's just some infrastructure, uh, software testing is weird, that's what developers do. And, and that's totally fine. Um, I started my journey as a sysadmin doing Windows administration, and I don't mean like the kind of cool Windows administration we have now, not like PowerShell and software development and that kind of thing. I mean like Windows NT, Windows 2000, like I click on stuff and drag things and maybe put a floppy in and try to figure out why device drivers don't work. Uh, so my job was very much traditional sysadmin, point and click, this and that, and, and I really got hit with a ton of bricks when infrastructure as code came in. I was still doing operations work, and I was even doing web ops work for a pretty, uh, a pretty important, pretty high traffic website, but it was still Windows, it was still Windows 2003 and 2008, and it was still very much pointy clicky. There was a little bit of some fancy bat scripts, but, but not definitely not the advances that we have now. Um, so I made a lot of excuses. I made excuses for why I didn't need to test that infrastructure. Uh, it took a lot of time, and sure, it does. It does take a lot of time. Uh, it was hard, also completely valid. Uh, testing requires you to learn new things, and that is hard work. Uh, quite often, you will spend significantly more time on the test than you do on the actual code that you're trying to test. And the last one is kind of like me almost putting a, a bit of a manager hat on, and that was that it slowed us down, right? We were trying to compete with competition that was 10 times larger than us, and I just didn't have time for this. I needed to get that code out there, I needed to deploy it, we needed to ship. And if I spent time testing, that was time you know, we weren't making money. Uh, but I was really leaving out one thing. Even though these were all completely valid, I was leaving out that it was just quite simply my job. Uh, testing the infrastructure was my job. And it doesn't matter what your title is, because I was a sysadmin at the time. Uh, if you're a developer, you're writing software that's helping your business. And if you're on the off side of things, you're keeping that software up in order to help your business. And if you are lucky enough to be DevOpsy, then you're really just some combination somewhere between those two. But no matter what, your job is to keep infrastructure up, to deploy infrastructure, and that always has to help your business. And if we have failures, we're not helping our business. Those failures are hurting our business, and at that point, we're really just not doing our job. And unfortunately, as we move to infrastructure as code, and we move to Chef, even though these are fantastic tools, that's really just made our failures faster and uglier. Before, when I was clicking through servers, I might see a change on the third server that caused that problem. But now I push a change out and go and get coffee, and by the time I come back, that change is already deployed to 500 servers. So the, the ability to roll back your change, to see issues, and the instinct that goes along with that doesn't come into play anymore. And I think a good example of that is, is pre-configuration management, Tim. Um, I made a lot of changes. 98% of them were clearly fantastic, wonderful changes. Uh, I got some promotions. Uh, people were happy with it. 2% of them were bad. And by bad, I mean like Johnny drop tables, outage, horrible, horrible, website down, bad. And that seems pretty high. Like Looking back at it now, I'm like, yeah, it's probably about 2%. Uh, it might be bad at first glance, but I was only doing five changes a day, right? Pointy clicky, you can't do much. Uh, so our mean time to failure as a company was very low. Our customers were happy, the website was up, the business was happy, we were making money, but we had to increase our velocity. Our competition was increasing their velocity and we had to stay relevant in the business world. So we took on configuration management, we brought in Chef, we increased our velocity, and Instantly, you see that my bad went to 1%. This is exactly what the business wanted. They wanted us to have automation reducing risk. So we, we automated away risk, right? Half of it, in fact. 
Because it turned out a lot of what I did was just clicking on the wrong thing, forgetting a checkbox, running the wrong command. I mean, that happens, right? When we're replicating the same thing across 50 servers by hand, we make mistakes. But unfortunately, I'm making 50 changes a day now, which means the business is not happy, the customers are not happy, because we're actually failing more. We have more outages than we've ever had before, and we have unhappy customers, simply because that increase in velocity came along with an increase in outages. So we have to utilize testing. There's really no choice. We cannot have an increase in velocity that also increases the, our outages at the same proportion. We want to see our nice, beautiful, up and to the right graph, but we want a nice, flat, horrible graph for our outages. <clears throat> so we decide it's time to jump in, right? We're going to start testing things. Uh, and the first thing we do is we go on Google and we search for chef testing, and this huge number of blog posts come back things that Joshua wrote you know, five years ago that aren't really valid at all. Somebody's telling you you should use mini tests, and they're like, 2012, and you're like, I don't understand this. This is too many tools. And the first thing we want to do is not do this. Do not search for the tools that we're, going to, that we're going to use. Instead, we want to put our developer hat on, and we want to think about what we actually want in terms of testing. So we have three kinds of testing that we're going to utilize within uh, Chef, within our infrastructure. There's certainly more kinds of software testing. If you ever want pain, search for software testing and find some nice, like, you know, IEEE doc that talks about it. Um, but these are three. And these are the three that we're, we're going to utilize today. And the first one is linting. Uh, and linting is when we statically analyze our code. And in the chef world, what we're going to do is look for style, syntax, and logic mistakes. And when I say statically analyze, what I mean is that we're not actually executing our code. What we're effectively doing is just a giant spell check. We're going to regex for things that we think shouldn't be there. And it sounds like, what can I possibly accomplish with that? But linting is really one of the best first things to grasp onto. We can grab a huge amount of value from just two simple tools. Uh, so the first part of that is style. And I put style in here first because when I say that I think style linting is important, a lot of people kind of scoff and chuck a little bit. They think it's like some OCD thing where I need you know, the proper spaces and tabs and whatnot. And it, it sort of is, a little bit, in all honesty. But I think that style is incredibly important. And I really do believe that style within your code can prevent outages. I put this picture here as a background uh, to illustrate the point. Uh, this is a phone trunk coming into a pedestal. If you live in the suburbs, you have one somewhere in your neighborhood. Somebody got the, the unlucky stick, and that's on their lawn. Uh, and inside is something like this, right? This is a whole bunch of people's home phone lines, and it works. It is functional, but it's awful at the same time. And if a phone tech comes out to make a change in this, the first thing they have to do is they have to grapple with everything that is wrong with this pile of cables. And they have to dig through that, and they have to understand what it is, and our code is exactly the same. And when a person makes a change here, there's a risk in dealing with this mess that they're making a change that's not what they intended to make. They might bump one of these cables. They might knock your phone line off. God forbid you don't have a fax machine going anymore. And we don't want that. And someone is going to inherit your code, no matter what. Even if you're in a single ops person shop or you're just a lone developer doing stuff, someone will inherit that code at some point, and they will have to read it. They'll have to interpret it. And we can do things within Ruby and, and within Chef as well that really are sometimes hard to interpret. So we want to make sure that we're all on the same page in terms of style. Now, the second one is syntax. And this is an incredibly important one, but really dead simple. Ruby is a language. Chef is a language. These both have rules to their language. We have to follow those rules. Uh, and if we have a missing end or a missing do in a block, that's obviously not valid syntax anymore. And the last thing we want to do is code up a wonderful, nice cookbook, upload it to production, and boom, all of our nodes fail. So we can avoid that super easily. We can syntax check within our linting process. We can make sure that what we have is, in fact, valid Ruby code. Uh, then we'll fail in a different way, but at least our code will run. And then the final one is logic. So this is the one I think is really fun. Uh, we have Chef the language. We have uh, Ruby the language. We can actually go through and see what you're doing within this code. And we can give you recommendations on things that might cause you problems. You might be just incorrectly using something. You might be using Chef in an unsafe way. Or you might be using something that's going to be deprecated at some point. And we can tell you not to do that. So we can give you little nudges to push you towards better code. And we can do that all without, again, ever running that code. 
So how do we lint within Chef? Well, we have two tools for linting in the Chef world. Uh, the first one is called CookStyle. Uh, CookStyle is a tool that we wrote at Chef. Uh, it's really a wrapper around RuboCop. RuboCop is a really popular Ruby linter. Uh, the problem with it is that it's a Ruby linter. Uh, Ruby has a different interpretation of the way some things should be than we think a cookbook should look. Uh, Chef Cookbook is not a Ruby application. So we've bundled RuboCop with a customized rule set, and we think this is a, a rule set that's really good for writing cookbooks. You can run this and you can get everybody on the same page. You can interpret uh, a community cookbook where somebody is also using CookStyle and everyone will have similar looking code. And the cool thing within CookStyle is that it comes with auto-correcting. So you're not just gonna get a bunch of warnings that's gonna tell you you're using bad spaces or like you, know, you need to have extra commas somewhere. It's just gonna fix it for you. And 95% and of these things will just be fixed automatically. So you can take your existing code base and you can just run cookstyle-a against it and boom, you're all in the same style and you can just keep that going forward with some testing. Now then we have food critic. Uh, Whereas CookStyle is focused mostly on the styling and on the actual Ruby, Food Critic is actually written to look at what's going on within your cookbook, within primarily the logic of the cookbook, but also the syntax of the chef code. And we have a ton of rules here. We've got about 87, I think, now. Uh, shipped like about 15 in the last month that you'll get with Chef DK2. And a lot of rules, particularly about doing things that are just gonna be broken. Uh, incorrectly using custom resources and LWRPs, and then lots and lots of rules about new deprecations that we're introducing. So as you want to migrate to Chef 12, to Chef 13, to Chef 14, you're going to see uh, warnings within your code. Again, before you ever run it, before you ever install that version of Chef, you'll be able to run Food Critic and see exactly what you have to update. And here's an example out it, uh, output of it. It's kind of small, obviously. Uh, there's kind of two things you'll see here. Uh, I just picked randomly a cookbook on the supermarket. This one was pretty good because it had a LWRP in it. Uh, this is missing a bunch of metadata fields. That's going to make it a little tricky if you want to share it on the supermarket. These are fields that we're keying off to fill in data there. Uh, it's also missing a license, so some people won't even be able to consume this because you're not properly telling them what the license is. Uh, and then it has a LWRP that's simply not doing the right thing. So we're warning you that you're not using inline resources and you're using updated by last action. So this is something that you could write and it is valid chef code and it would run, but it might not actually do what you think it's doing. So we're gonna warn you right off the bat that your code might not give you the desired outcome. And you might look at one of these and go like, what is FC74? And luckily we have nice documentation. Uh, foodcritic.io has a documentation section for each rule. So you can look at it, you can get a description of what it is, and you can see a little example of the before and after code. In this case, uh, we're just telling you that you are setting the default action wrong and there's a simpler way to do it. So that's linting. Uh, the next one I talk about is unit testing. Uh, unit testing is when you're looking at the individual components of your cookbook and you're really just testing that given a certain set of inputs, that you'll get a certain set of outputs out. Now this is really, really important when you're writing Ruby applications. Uh, you can very easily test classes and methods. It's a little different in the Chef world. We'll talk about that a little bit. Uh, Chef spec, though, brings RSpec testing to Ruby. It's just extensions on top of RSpec. Allows you to write unit tests like they're just standard RSpec tests uh, and inspect what's going on within your Chef code. So this is a, just a simple example cookbook. Uh, I thought it was actually a Seth Vargo cookbook. Turned out it's actually a Jamie cookbook goes way back, uh, and this is my face. So it's really simplified here, but this looks a lot like a lot of the cookbooks that we have uh, floating out in the real world. So it's just a package that gets installed, uh, some sort of configuration that happens, and then a service that gets managed and restarted and whatnot. Uh, and if we write chef spec for this, it would look something like this, right? And the first thing we're gonna see is this is actually larger than the cookbook, uh, and also harder to read than the cookbook. Uh, so I'll break down the individual sections and what is, what is happening here at a high level. Uh, we're certainly not going to dive into chef spec because it's crazy complex and hard. Uh, the first part is that we're setting up a chef solo run, and we're doing that using mocked data, right? So we might be testing this on my Mac. We're not on an Ubuntu 16.04 box, but we need it to look like an Ubuntu 16.04 box. So we have data for each major operating system, and we can mock out this Ubuntu 16.04 box, and then we can do an in-memory converge of Chef. So that, again, we're not running Chef, nothing's happening on your local system, we're just seeing sort of what would happen 
when chef runs. And then once chefs run, we can actually do a bunch of different tests on it. So we're going to describe what we're testing. In the top case there, it's installing the package. And then we can say what we expect. So we expect the package was installed, right? And that's all great, except it's totally not. Uh, and I, I really can't stress enough here that that is the most worthless chef spec ever. And unfortunately, it's what most people use. Uh, chef spec is a really great tool for a lot of people, but unfortunately, a lot of cookbooks simply don't need unit tests. And the example there is this. Uh, so we had three resources in that cookbook, and we have three very simple uh, chef spec tests. And that one-to-one -one mapping tells me right off the bat that we don't actually have any logic within that cookbook. There's nothing to test because there's no logic. If you write out that a package should be installed, and then you write a chef spec that says the package was installed, you're not actually testing your cookbook at that point. You're actually testing chef, and we already test chef, so you should probably just not do that. And I see a lot of people who say, you know, I need 100% code coverage, I have to test, but chef spec is for the logic. So test the logic, and you should test the logic that you have very well, but if your cookbook lacks logic, if it looks like that previous cookbook, then don't test it. Just skip chef spec entirely. Now, what if our MyFace cookbook was a little bit more complex? It's not just supporting Ubuntu now. We need it to support CentOS, and CentOS might have a different package name. Well, now we have logic, right? Now we have a different package that has to get installed on a different platform. So we can actually test that at this point, and we can converge two different platforms. Now, this is a real chef spec. This will actually deliver some value to our company. If someone did refactoring later on, and they you know, messed with that case statement that we had, or the if statement that we had that changed what that package name was, this will alert us that it doesn't work. But there's a second warning, and that is that even perfect specs, even that spec before, really don't catch most of the failures that we have. And the, the reason is that when we're writing a cookbook, what we're doing is we're codifying our assumptions. And we're making a lot of assumptions when we first write that cookbook. So in this simple example here, the first thing is, does my face the package exist? Do we have a repository to even install that? Because if I simply test that I tried to install the package and then my spec says that the package was installed, I'll never catch the fact that the package doesn't even exist in the repository. Is this a valid configuration even? Did a new version of MyFace come out that no longer accepts some syntax I'm using? Is that service even there? Is there no longer maybe a sysv init script that I need? Can this even start? So a chef spec won't catch those real failures. And for that, we need integration testing. And this is really the important part within chef testing. We want to uh, integrate all of our software together, not just our cookbook, but our dependencies. We want to test them all together. And we want to do that in a way that looks as much like production as possible. So that's going to be a real chef run, right? This run here. Totally not something you can comprehend or read, but like we're actually testing that cookbook. All its dependencies are coming together. It's being compiled. It's converging. If we're trying to install a package, that package has to exist within the repository. It's a real run, right? And for that, we have Test Kitchen. Test Kitchen is a super great tool. Uh, let's us create a simple little YAML like this and converge multiple scenarios while on multiple platforms. So in this case, what we're going to do is we're going to set the system up. We're going to converge on Vagrant. Uh, this could be different things if we want a different driver. So we could converge, say, on OpenStack or AWS or Azure. But we're going to converge on Vagrant, which is going to run locally on my Mac with VirtualBox. We're going to use Chef Zero as our provisioner. That's going to make it look as much like a Chef server as we possibly can. And then we'll talk a little bit later, but we're going to verify using Inspect when we're done. So as, as far as platforms go, we're going to converge on four different platforms here. We have CentOS and Ubuntu, recent releases. These are from our Bento project. So as new releases of, of free distros come out, we're going to constantly be delivering more Bento images. So you can always say, oh, well, you know, when CentOS 7.4 comes out, I want to test on that, because that's what I use in production. There will be a 7.4 uh, image here. You can just pull it down automatically. And then this is the actual bread and butter here. We actually have to test something, right? So we're going to converge two different suites here. One is going to be a client install of my face, whatever that would be. And then the other one is going to be a server install. And the part to point out here is that we're using test recipes. And really, you want to do yourself a favor. Write a real test recipe. 
this gives you the real life scenario of how the cookbook actually would come together. If you have LWRPs or custom resources, you can utilize them within a test recipe. You can execute them in different scenarios. If you have dependencies that need to be installed first, you can put those all in your test recipe and really test the way that this cookbook would get used in production. But when we put that all together, you get this, right? Simple output. We have eight different converges that we'll be doing here, and we could run kitchen converge. That would build all these systems out. We can log into them if we need to troubleshoot them, or we could just say kitchen tests and it would build them all and tear them down. But did it actually work, right? Because you want to test your business, not mine. My business is Converging Chef nodes. Your business is whatever you do. And for that node to simply converge doesn't mean it actually works. So for that, we need inspec. And uh, Christoph talked about inspec a lot, so he kind of got a brief description of what we can do with that from a, a compliance world. Uh, it's really a hugely powerful tool when we're talking about kitchen testing. And InSpec allows us to write really, really simple R-spec tests. They actually look a lot like the chef spec tests, uh, but these are running against a real node, right? We've converged this node in test kitchen, and now we can check it and verify it. So we know that the system is actually the way our system in production will look. And it's great because there's 82 built-in resources. And those 82 built-in resources allow us to do all kinds of cool testing. So we can test the outcomes of our chef resources. We can look at all the basic things like packages and directories and groups. Or we can dig a little bit deeper into system configs. We can look at Grub and network bonding and Windows features and services. Uh, and we're also building out a lot more application configuration things. And again, this is what powers our compliance uh, product. So as you see more and more people that want to actually check the compliance of their applications, you're going to see those resources come into InSpec. We're doing about a release a week of InSpec, and every release is coming with new resources. So as time goes on, you have more and more things, more helpers to allow you to simply test and say, hey, can I connect to Postgres? I don't want to have to do a shell out to that. I want to just simply say, like, does Postgres work? Is this database there? So this is what uh, one of our tests would look like. I pulled this out of our uh, Tomcat cookbook. Uh, it seems like it's a weird thing to test. We're testing a file, um, and then we're checking to see if it's a directory, if it has an owner, a right group, different mode. Uh, this was being used within a custom resource we had in the Tomcat cookbook, and we're actually executing that, cook, that resource in different ways, and this test is formulated to make sure that all the different properties that we're setting on that resource are actually working. So very simple way to make sure that what we wrote, all of our assumptions and expectations are actually coming out. And that gets us something like this. And this is, this is confidence, really. Like, this is me converging a full cookbook on a platform and saying it meets maybe 30 or 40 different things that I expect to be there. And we want to make sure that we're writing our tests to actually check for our desired outcomes. And what are those desired outcomes? Because this is one of the most important things, and I see people often do this in their tests, where they don't... They don't test the right thing. They've, they've written really elegant tests. Maybe they're even using you know, full automation. They've got test kitchen running, inspect running. But what they're testing is not delivering the value that they need. We want to make sure that we balance both system outcomes and business outcomes. So in that first example I used there, I was testing a bunch of things like file mode and users and groups. That was making sure that my system worked, making sure that when a person put an input on a property for a custom resource, that I got the desired output. But my business doesn't care about who owns the Tomcat file. My business cares that Tomcat works. So you want to make sure that not only are you writing your kind of sysadmin-y tests, but also the tests that just make sure that this is going to do the function it has for your business. If it's a Tomcat server, can I get response back? Is that response a 200? Is it valid data? If it's an API, like, let's hit the API. Let's hit some endpoints. Let's make sure they're performant. Let's check the response times. These are things that actually matter to your business, because they don't care that the application is there. They don't care that the service has started. And you, quite frankly, you don't even need to check that the service has started. Just hit the URL. So we have all this. We have our perfect tests. Where do we stand at this point? Right? We've done a whole bunch of different tools to give us a slew of different kinds of testing. But how do we actually run these tools? I don't expect you to sit down and type cook style every time and food critic every time. We need a nice way to bring this all together. And we need a nice way to automatically do it for all of our changes. So the first thing I'm going to talk about is delivery local. Uh, this is part of Chef DK. This is something 
that our delivery team actually wrote for our cookbook engineering team because we had exactly this problem. How do I run all my tests over and over again, and how do I do them across all my infrastructure? Well, delivery local uh, gives us the ability to write this really simple TOML file here. It defines a bunch of phases. It's very similar if you've used uh, automate to what we have in automate, but it actually runs entirely locally. You're not using cookbooks for this. You're just using a simple TOML file. And in these phases, you just define the command that you'd want to run. So we say our linting phase is going to be cook style. Our syntax phase will be food critic. If we don't want to run the phase, we just hit skip. But you probably have more than one cookbook. I really hope that your business is not one cookbook. Um, so managing these files becomes really burdensome. What if there's a food critic check that you don't think is important to you? Well, you can turn that off on the command line. But do you want to turn that off in, say, 100 cookbooks? Because that's what I used to have to do. And it was really a pain to be shuffling around things like rake files or food critic configs. Well, the really neat thing you get with the de delivery local mode is you can delete that entire file and you can just point it at a URL. And then you can put the contents of what you want the file to look like in that page. So in the cookbook world, in community cookbooks, we have a single gist that is just what we want it to look like. And anytime I run this locally or anytime I run it in a CI system or anytime anyone runs it, all my other developers in the community, they're always getting the latest updates. So if I want to change the way people test that cookbook, I just do it in the remote file and everyone gets it every time they run. And then if I run it locally, like this is it. It's delivery local all, and the all is that I'm running all those phases. If I wanted to run just the syntax, delivery local syntax, but I can just deliver local all and get a nice little output of all the tests. But I will obviously want to run that automatically, right? I'm not expecting my developers to run this locally on their system every time, because they, quite frankly, they won't. Someone will skip it at some point, you'll forget, and that'll be the time that you'll introduce a breaking change. So we need a CI system, right? And we have one, you can buy it, it's great, you should get it. I have a mortgage, it needs to be paid. Um, but what if you don't have Automate? Because maybe you're open source only, maybe you're not at that scale for an Automate server, not everybody you know, necessarily needs that infrastructure. Well, we can definitely make this work. It becomes a lot harder, but we can do it. And we can bring it in Travis CI, uh, but unfortunately, as soon as we get into a SaaS CI system, we're instantly losing a lot of control, right? We're not running this in Automate, we're not running in Jenkins, we don't have control over what's happening on our builders, and there's a lot of security concerns for that CI system, so they're not gonna let us run everything we wanna run. We can't just kitchen vagrant. So instead, what we're gonna have to do is we're gonna have to run kitchen docking. Now, kitchen docking, is something that Sean O'Mara wrote when he was on our, our uh, community cookbook team. And he wrote this so that we could actually run Test Kitchen, not just quickly for him locally, but also somewhere where we could run it in Travis. And it's just another driver for Test Kitchen. So it looks a lot uh, like we had with Vagrant, but instead of it being Vagrant, it's basically docking, docking, docking. Uh, it controls the whole thing. It actually takes over for Chef. Uh, it doesn't even use the full Chef client install. It uses its own container of Chef, which makes that even faster. Uh, but that lets us do some great things with wonderful, wonderful warnings. And that is that now we're testing in Docker. And Docker containers kind of lie to us. Uh, when we're testing on that full Ubuntu VM, that's a 480 meg image. Uh, and that is a compressed Vagrant box, right? This, that's not just an uncompressed horrible thing. That's 480 megs of packages and configs and everything it takes to be an Ubuntu system. But now we go to that same thing in a container and it's 47 megs. So what's the difference? It's not magical Docker compression. That's missing a lot of things, right? That Docker container is not meant to be a VM. It's not a stand-in for a system. It was meant for us to run our Node app or our Ruby app or something on. So we need to do a bit of work to kind of hack those containers to look like they're actually VMs. And this is dirty, dirty stuff, but it does work. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna install a whole bunch of stuff, right? We need init systems, we need packet managers, we need network tools, process tools, we need a whole bunch of things, and they look different on every platform and every version of that platform. Uh, and thankfully, we've already done that. So we have a nice example repo here, I'll show it again at the end. Uh, and that example repo has an example of how we set up Kitchen Dockin and all the things we need for it to actually, you know, be able to start a system D service. So within that Kitchen Dockin config, 
Uh, again, I said it looks a lot like the Kitchen Vagrant config, but obviously now we're configuring a container. So what we're doing, uh, just a simple example here, we're setting the CentOS 6 image. Uh, we're gonna grab that from Docker Hub. Uh, we're setting the PID1 command, and that's basically allowing us to actually start a service and have it run using init. Uh, and then the intermediate instruction here is to install a bunch of packages. And that's what I was talking about. We have to make this thing look a little bit more like a real CentOS system. In order to do that, we need simple things like net tools, because otherwise we can't check if a port's open. But once we have that all, once we put that all together and we hack these systems to look like it, we have really nice, fast kitchen runs. Fast kitchen runs that could be on your desktop, but also fast kitchen runs that could be in Travis. So how does that look in Travis? Well, again, it's a nice, huge config that you should totally just copy from us. Uh, and there's a few different things that are going on in there, and I'll quickly go over them. Uh, basically, we install ChefDK within Travis. Uh, ChefDK is an approved repository with Travis, so you can install it right in your Chef run, uh, or right in your Travis run, and that means that you're not testing with gems anymore. You're actually testing the same way you would test on your workstation, and the setup is gonna be the same as when you go into production with Chef. Uh, we're gonna turn on Docker, because obviously we need Docker. Uh, we're going to define each of the different systems we're gonna run. So in this case, I'm just gonna converge four different instances. It's only one suite on four different platforms. We're gonna do some boring stuff to make sure that IP tables is set up and that all of the ChefDK binary is available for us. Then we're going to um, run it all. And then the last part there is you see we inject one more job. And that's because we want to split out all of our non-test kitchen stuff into its own job in Travis. And that means that if somebody accidentally puts an extra space in and now cook style fails, it doesn't fail every single one of our things. It makes it much more apparent how it failed. Uh, and when we put that all together, uh, we get something like this. And I cannot stress how awesome it is to have these come in. This is a PR that someone opened uh, against OpenSSH. They wanna make a simple config change, but I don't know if that config change introduces breaking problems across other platforms. It might, who knows. Uh, so we're gonna converge it on those platforms, right? We're gonna converge it on Ubuntu and Debian and CentOS and even OpenSUSE. And then we're also gonna run all of our cook style and food critic and chef spec uh, unit and linting tests. And that entirety of that testing ran in five minutes. So in five minutes, I have confidence that this is gonna work. And that's really just confidence that I'm not gonna burn my infrastructure to the ground. And as the person writing community cookbooks, I'm not gonna burn your infrastructure to the ground, because I really hope that doesn't happen. But that also, very importantly, just brings value to our business. And at the end of the day, that's what this is actually about, right? We want to be able to know that if we take a simple configuration change that we think of, we can make that, we can take it through a series of testing, we can deploy it with confidence, and we can actually achieve what our business wants. So uh, go home, test your infrastructure. I just ask that you don't write bad chef spec tests. That's my only ask here. Uh, and this is the example repository. Uh, there's a ton of great stuff in there, and you can kind of look also at all of our various community cookbooks. They do the same thing. We're testing everything in Travis. Um, and yeah, good luck. Does anybody have any questions? Just real quick, what's a test cookbook? You mentioned that before. Yeah, so you can have, if you do uh, in Chef DK, if you just say Chef uh, generate cookbook, you'll get your base cookbook. It's gonna create a recipes folder, an attributes folder. It's also gonna create another cookbook within there that's just for testing. So particularly as you start to move to writing resources instead of uh, actual recipes, you need to make sure that that resource actually works, right? So in the case of the Tomcat cookbook that we ship, there's no recipe for the Tomcat. We just ship you three resources to work with Tomcat. So we need to be able to test that. So we have to create a recipe that can actually go through and set a Tomcat server up. That recipe does an apt update, installs Java, you know, pulls down a WAR file after Tomcat setup, starts it. We can make sure that that's, that's a real site. That's the way somebody would use it. Because not all of our recipes are things that, or cookbooks are things that we would directly apply to a node. They might be a cookbook that we are consuming from another cookbook. So we still wanna make sure we test that, and we can kind of fake it out with a full test suite. It also allows you, like in the Tomcat cookbook, we're setting it up like three or four different ways. I think we set up like three different Tomcat sites 
that kind of utilize our resources in different ways and makes it really easy to just converge that all at once, test it, take it through a bunch of inspect tests and make sure everything looks good. Is there a, res a, a place I can find good examples of chef spec tests? Um, and are, are there some cookbooks where I just wouldn't want to have any tests because they're not needed? Uh, there's, there's not a definitive good example of good chef spec tests. Um, I think the problem is understanding when you need to use unit tests is kind of tricky. Uh, and as soon as I said, like, don't write chef spec, all these people were like, but I have this scenario. And like, we use them extensively in community cookbooks. Because we have a lot of logic. Like we're supporting sometimes 15 different platforms and version combinations. So you can get just a simple thing of like, what's the name of the package? And it can be a case statement with like nested ifs. And if somebody makes a tiny little change to that, they break the entire thing. So it's like that scenario is fantastic for chef spec. Um, off the head, on top of my head, I can't think of some of our cookbooks that haven't set up correctly. Uh, there certainly are some that, that are tested very well with chef spec, where somebody's going through the logic and they're not just copying one to one. Uh, the biggest thing I would say just in chef spec to keep yourself from doing the wrong thing is don't turn on the post converge report. A lot of people see this and it says, oh, you have 20% code coverage. Like, I want 100% code coverage. The only way you get 100% code coverage is just to copy every single resource and say, oh, I'm testing that this directory was created or this package was installed. That's when you really get yourself into writing uh, chef spec. It's just not, it doesn't bring value. It's not going to hurt you, but there's probably something better in terms of testing you can do with your time. So you mentioned bento boxes. Um, and then with Dockin, you have to put a few packages on there. Might, might there be bento containers in the future? Yeah, bento containers are definitely something we've thought about. Um, we've, we've considered what we could do to actually make basically like fat containers. Um, so instead of shipping you that 47 meg Ubuntu, you know, straight from Docker Hub container, we would have like a, an actual chef slash Ubuntu 16.04 container that was maybe 150 megs, um, which would actually be a lot faster too, because you wouldn't have to do the installs. Um, the problem with that is that's us committing to updating those constantly, and the bento stuff is already a ton of work. Um, we're, we're cutting out the bento images. Uh, for you know, VirtualBox, Parallels, and VMware, and getting that all to work, getting those those three different VM technologies to all converge on 20 platforms and versions, is really hard. Uh, there's constant regressions that happen in, in you know the VMware tools or the VirtualBox tools, uh, and poking Travis or not Travis, poking Packer to make that all work is hard. Um, but I, I really would like to do that. It's just a matter of having resources. Um, so based on your presentation, what is the point of writing a chef spec test as opposed to like an inspect test? Like you mentioned like a chef spec basically tests to see if your chef code works, but you, that already, convergence already does that. So I, I guess I'm just trying to see the difference. To me, it makes much more sense to do integration testing, but I'm just trying to see what the point of chef spec. Uh, would it's be. really about the time for your feedback loop. So you running that convergence, even in Travis, you know, that took five minutes, right? But that wouldn't take five minutes on my laptop. And if I was doing that with Vagrant and not with Kitchen Docking, if I actually wanted to get a full convergence of a real system in Vagrant, I could be spending a long time. And those are simple examples of packages, like that's, that's five minutes to run OpenSSH, where SSHD and a config is dropped. But what if I'm doing something that is a very complex system setup? I could be testing that for like three or four hours. Um, whereas I can run chef spec and in a minute get back uh, a whole bunch of converges. I can set attributes differently. I can go through a bunch of different scenarios, uh, different versions of, of, you know, say three Ubuntu versions and three CentOS versions with different attributes set here and there and uh, different recipes used. Uh, and you could have hundreds of different permutations of what that test looks like that still runs in, you know, two or three minutes. Um, as far as I remember, maybe, maybe I'm wrong, but uh, Test Kitchen allows you to do, like, tests one by one. Is there some way to, you know, deploy several, um, several instances at the same time if you have like clusterization or replication or something like that? 
Uh, so we don't have the concept of cluster testing in Test Kitchen. Uh, that's something that comes up a lot, and it adds a huge amount of complexity because you kind of get into Test Kitchen needing to be an orchestrator, which is really beyond the scope of Test Kitchen. Uh, we thought about how we could do it in a simple way, and, and the problem is as soon as we introduce something that's the simple way, uh, people are going to want all the different versions that become the complex way, and then we've built this massive orchestration uh, testing solution. Um, but you can, you know, if you want to run more than one test, uh, the same test, but more than one at a time, like in the scenario that I had where we had eight different total tests there, you could concurrent that. Uh, and that's pretty handy if you're testing against like EC2 or something. You could spin up eight boxes at the same time. So. All right. Cool. If anybody else has any questions, uh, hit me up. I'm around. Uh, definitely always on community Slack, too. So.